This video outlines the principles of landmark guided arterial line insertion. There are specific arterial line cannula sets available, but a 20 gauge intravenous cannula is very commonly used and will be illustrated here. They generally work very well with one caveat based on my personal experience. In adults, always use a longer cannula as short cannulae are extremely prone to mechanical damping of the arterial waveform, creating inaccurate measurements and difficulty with aspiration for blood sampling. Extend the patient's wrist and stretch the overlying skin using a support such as a rolled up towel or small intravenous bag. Fix this position by taping from the base of the thumb to the side of the bed or table. Taping the thumb rather than across the entire palm supinates the forearm more completely and effectively, especially in anesthetized patients. Another tip, especially if working alone, is to place the arterial line tubing within easy reach for connection to the cannula later before you start the procedure. Wherever possible, I strongly recommend standing facing towards the patient's head so that you are advancing the cannula along your line of sight. The ability to line up the cannula with the artery and keep it in line is significantly improved compared to standing at the side of the patient and advancing across your line of sight. This would create a slight parallax error, which contributes to inaccuracy in puncturing the artery. As an aside, this same principle also applies to accuracy of in-plane needle beam alignment in ultrasound-guided nerve blocks and vascular procedures. After sterilizing the skin appropriately, Place a sterile towel over the patient's palm. I do not drape proximal to the wrist as this is not an area that we will be touching. It's important to have the edge of the towel as flat as possible so it, that it does not impede your ability to flatten the trajectory of the cannula once you've pierced the artery. Gently palpate for arterial pulsation with the second and third fingertips, rolling over the vessel to determine its apex and thus central axis. An insertion point close to the wrist crease is generally preferred rather than more proximally as the radial artery dives deeper further up the wrist. However, the radial artery can also be tortuous close to the wrist crease, so ensure that you also palpate and identify a straight segment to enter. Once you've located a good pulsation point at which to puncture the artery, puncture the skin one to two millimeters away from where you intend to pierce the artery. Whether it's an intravenous or arterial line, I always separate what I call the poke point, where I enter the skin, from the puncture point, where I'm actually entering the vessel. This poke point should also be where you infiltrate local anesthetic in an awake patient, so as not to obliterate your ability to palpate the arterial pulse. In addition, the separation between the poke point and the puncture point is also because a steeper angle is needed to cleanly pierce the tougher tissue layer. The aim here is just to pierce the skin and enter the loose subcutaneous tissue as the first step. Once the needle tip is in the subcutaneous tissues, flatten the trajectory as you advance towards the artery. The radial artery is generally a very shallow structure in most patients and should be approached as though you were trying to cannulate a superficial vein. This will avoid piercing the back wall as you enter the vessel and going through and through. Remember that this is a cannulation procedure and not just an arterial stab to obtain a single arterial blood gas sample. You should only be lightly palpating the artery, not compressing it or pushing it to one side. Advance in a slow, controlled manner at a shallow angle Drive forward in a straight line without trying to steer the needle tip left or right as you advance. Arterial puncture by the stylet is signaled by a tactile pop and flashback of blood into the stylet hub. Flatten the trajectory even more, parallel to the surface of the wrist, before advancing the cannula 1-2 to two millimeters forward to bring the cannula tip into the artery. This next step is critical. You must verify that the cannula tip is lying within the arterial lumen before trying to advance it off the stylet. Remember that flashback into the hub only means that the stylet tip has entered the artery. It does not mean that the cannula tip is necessarily within the lumen. Once you flatten your insertion angle and advance the entire stylet cannula assembly another couple of millimeters into the artery, hold the cannula in place and then withdraw the stylet to bring the stylet tip into the cannula. 
If the tip of the cannula is lying within the artery, capillary action will result in backflow of blood along the cannula and it will turn red. Only if and when you see this should you then advance the cannula off of the stylet. These principles are illustrated here in a different video clip. Note that the cannula should be advanced off the stylet in a smooth, slow, and controlled fashion. Any resistance to advancement of the cannula signifies a problem or obstruction, and force should never be used. If there was no backflow of blood along the cannula, it means the tip is not within the arterial lumen. Either you haven't advanced it far enough to enter the artery, or more likely, the stylet and cannula have been advanced too far and have exited the back wall of the artery. This is especially likely if your needle trajectory was not flat enough. At this point, you will have transfixed the artery and thus will need to use a guide wire to rescue the insertion. Compress the artery proximal to the tip of the cannula as you withdraw the stylet. It's not demonstrated here, but I prefer to compress with the fourth and fifth fingers of my left hand and then use my thumb and index finger to hold the cannula hub in place as the stylet comes out. Reach for the arterial line tubing, flick off the end cap, and insert the end firmly into the cannula hub. This stops most of the backflow. Twist the tubing onto it to secure the connection. With practice, this can be done without too much mess as demonstrated here by my resident. Before taping the cannula in place, rotate the cannula and tubing so that the fixed loop of tubing is facing out lateral towards the thumb, rather than trying to rotate it only after you've taped everything down. The key with taping the catheter is to avoid putting mechanical stress forces on the cannula that might kink it and dampen the arterial waveform. Here we're dressing with a small tegadum, but you can use any similar dressing that you have available. The key is not to stretch the dressing and compress or kink the cannula in the process. Release the tape holding the thumb to return the wrist to a neutral position before finishing the taping process so that the cannula will be secured in its natural position as much as possible, which again minimizes issues with kinking and mechanical damping. I don't have a video illustrating what to do if your first insertion pass is unsuccessful. However, here are the basic principles. If you fail to pierce the artery in your first pass, before you withdraw the cannula, Palpate to see where the arterial pulsation is located in relation to the cannula. Is the artery either lateral or medial? Or, if your trajectory was too steep, is the cannula under the artery? Very rarely, you may be too superficial and over the artery, but this almost never happens. Based on this assessment, withdraw the needle into the subcutaneous tissues and make the appropriate redirection correction to the trajectory and then reinsert. If the radial artery pulsation is very weak or even undetectable despite a good non-invasive blood pressure in the upper arm, consider whether the patient has a superficial radial artery. This occurs in roughly 1 in 100 individuals and features a radial artery that, instead of lying in the lateral groove next to the flexor tendons at the wrist, travels obliquely over the anatomical snuff box and the base of the thumb. The artery may have an accessory branch that lies in the usual expected location, but this is usually of smaller diameter or caliber and thus often leads to difficulty if you attempt to cannulate the radial artery in its traditional location. Palpation over the snuff box may reveal a stronger pulsation and if ultrasound imaging is available, use it to image the radial artery and detect the presence of a superficial radial artery. This also allows you to trace the radial artery proximally to the bifurcation point and to cannulate it at this location. Calcified arteries are another reason for weak or undetectable pulses. They're a common problem in elderly patients with arteriosclerosis. Ultrasound is again generally very helpful here and highly recommended. However, an issue here can be that the artery is much more difficult to penetrate, and in the elderly with lax in mobile tissues, 
the artery will often slide away from the cannula as you attempt to pierce the artery. Good technique with meticulous attention to being in line with the central axis of the artery is essential. A hybrid needling approach can also be useful. The out-of-plane short axis view is used to ensure that the needle is advancing in the central axis of the vessel. This ensures that the needle shaft is now aligned with the central axis of the artery. The probe is then rotated 90 degrees to an in-plane long axis view to adjust the trajectory angle and to help guide the cannula into the lumen, which is narrowed by calcification. This also minimizes the risk of piercing the back wall and going through and through.